Okay. So, AI Solzhenitsyn. We are on chapter seven for anyone just joining. Thank you. You know, once I had a Jedi braid, uh, thinking about doing that again, I had a haircut a couple of days. But, um, so yeah, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, for anyone who's just tuning in, wrote the Gulag Archipelago, brought down the Soviet Union. There are previous videos available. And uh, for anyone who's curious of who Solzhenitsyn is, he's basically uh, wrote the darker side of Russian history via living it. Uh, this is his semi-bio... Semi, semi bio autographical, yes, novel. And here we go with chapter seven of Cancer Ward The Right to Treat. Chapter seven The Right to Treat. The strange thing is that if Kostoglatov had preserved with his questions, what sort of injection was it? What was its purpose? Was it really necessary and morally justified? If he had forced Ludmila Afansievna to explain the workings and the possible consequences of the new treatment, then very possibly he would have rebelled once and for all. But precisely at this point, having exhausted all his brilliant arguments, he had capitulated. She had been deliberately cunning she had mentioned the injection as something quite insignificant because she was tired of all this explaining. Also, she knew for sure that this was the moment after the action of the X-rays in their pure state had been tested on the patient. To deal the tumor yet another crucial blow, it was a treatment highly recommended for this particular type of cancer by the most up-to-date authorities. Now that she anticipated the amazing success that attended Kostoglatov's treatment, she could not possibly weaken before his obstinacy or neglect to attack him with all the weapons she believed in. True, there were no slides available with sections of his primary, but all her intuition, her powers of observation, and her memory suggested to her that the tumor was the kind she suspected, not a teratoma, not a sarcoma. It was on this very type of tumor, with precisely these secondaries, that Dr. Donsova was writing her doctoral thesis. In fact, she was not writing it full time. She had begun it sometime in the past, dropped it, and added a bit more from time to time. Her teacher, Dr. Orsachenkov and her friends tried to convince her it would come out splendidly. But she was always harried and oppressed by circumstances and could no longer foresee a time when she'd be in a position to present it. This wasn't through any lack of experience or material. On the contrary, there was too much of both. Every day, they would call her either to the x-ray screen or the laboratory or to someone's bedside to combine this with hours of selecting and describing x-ray photographs with formulations and systemization, let alone with passing the preliminary exams, was beyond human strength. She could have obtained a six-month sabbatical for research, but there was never a day when her patients were doing quite well enough or when her training sessions with the three young interns could be cut short so that she could go off for half a year. Ludmila Afansievna believed it was Leo Tolstoy who had said about his brother, he had all the abilities, but none of the defects of a real writer. Perhaps she didn't have the defects of a PhD either. She had no particular desire to hear people whisper as she passed. She's not an ordinary doctor. She's a doctor of philosophy. She's Donsova. 
nor to see those tiny but so weighty initials added at the head of her articles. More than a dozen of them had already been published. All short, but to the point. True, a little extra money never came amiss. But if the thing wasn't going to come off, it just wasn't going to. When it came to what is called day-to-day -day scientific work, she had enough to do without the thesis. In their hospital, they had conferences on clinical anatomy, analyzing mistaken diagnoses and treatment and reporting on new methods. Attendance and active participation in these were essential. Of course, the radiotherapists and surgeons in any case consulted daily to sort out mistakes and decide on new methods. But the conferences were a thing apart. In town, too, there was a scientific society of x-ray specialists which held lectures and demonstrations. In addition to this, a society of oncologists had recently been started. Donsova was not only a member, but secretary too. And, as in all new ventures, things were pretty hectic. And then there was the Institute for Advanced Medical Training. And there was correspondence with the Radiologist's Journal, and the Oncological Journal, and the Academy of Medical Science, and the Information Center. And so, it appeared that although big science seemed to be confined to Moscow and Leningrad, while out here they simply carried on treating people, nonetheless there was rarely a day devoted just to treatment without bothering about science. I think I killed that fly. God, that's annoying. Just crawling over the microphone. Anyway, I think that one is dead, and we will continue. Today had been typical. She had had to call the president of the Radiological Society about her forthcoming lecture. Then she'd had to glance through two short articles in a journal, reply to a letter from Moscow and to another from a cancer clinic out in the wilds, asking for clarification. In a few minutes, the senior surgeon, after finishing her day's work in the theater, was due to bring Donsova one of her gynecological patients for consultation. And then, toward the end of the outpatient's surgery, she had to take one of her interns to see the patient from Tashals with a suspected tumor of the small intestine. Later on today, there was a meeting she had arranged herself with the x-ray laboratory workers to discuss more efficient use of their apparatus. The idea was to process more patients, and Rasunov's embequine injection had to be kept in mind, too. She'd have to go up and see him. They had only just started treating patients in his condition. Up till then, they had sent them on to Moscow. She'd lost a lot of time in that nonsensical wrangle with pig-headed Kostoglatov, an indulgence on her part from a methodical point of view. The technicians in charge of refitting the gamma apparatus had twice peered around the door while they'd been talking. They wanted to show Donsova that certain work not foreseen in the estimates was now necessary and to get her to sign a chit for it and to try to square the senior doctor. Now they had finally collared her and were taking her there. But in the corridor on the way, a nurse gave her a telegram. It was from Novocherkask, from Anna Zatserko. They hadn't seen each other or written for 15 years. But she was her dear friend of the old days when they had studied midwifery together in Saratov in 1924, before she went to medical college. Anna's telegram said her eldest son, Vadim, would be coming to the clinic that day or the next. He had fallen ill on a geological expedition. Would Ludmila Afonsievna give him friendly attention and write explaining frankly 
what was wrong with him? Upset by this, she left the technicians and went to ask the matron to reserve Azovkin's bed for Vadim Zatserko till the end of the day. Mita, the matron, was, as always, dashing around the clinic, and it wasn't easy to find her. When at last she was found and had promised Vadim a bed, she presented Ludmila Afonsievna with a new problem. The best nurse in the radiotherapy department, Olympiada Vadislavovna, had been requested for a 10-day seminar of trade union treasurers in town. For those 10 days, a replacement would have to be found. This was so impossible and impermissible that Mita and Donsova strode there and then through room after room to the registrar's office to telephone the party district committee and get it canceled. But the telephone was engaged first at their end, then at the other, and when they got through, they were passed on and told to ring the union's area committee, who were absolutely astonished at the doctor's political irresponsibility. Did they really suppose trade union finances could be left to run themselves? Clearly, neither the party committee members nor the union committee members nor their relatives had yet been bitten by a tumor. Nor did they expect to be. Ludmila Afonsievna took the opportunity to ring the Radiological Society, then rushed off to ask the senior doctor to intercede, but he had some outsiders with him and was discussing the most economical way of repairing one wing of the building. So it was all left in the air, and she passed through the X-ray diagnosis department where she had no work that day on the way to her own room. The people in the department were taking a break, writing up their results by the light of the red lamp. They reported there and then to Ludmila Afonsievna that they had counted the reserves of film and that a present rate of consumption there was enough for only three more weeks. This meant an emergency because orders for film were never filled in less than a month. Donsova realized that either that day or the next, she'd have to arrange a meeting between the pharmacist and the senior doctor, not an easy thing to do, and get them to send off an order. After that, the gamma apparatus technicians barred her way in the corridor, and she signed their chit for them. She felt it was time to look in on the X-ray laboratory assistants, so she sat down and began to make a few calculations. Fundamental technical instructions laid it down that an apparatus should work one hour and then rest 30 minutes. But this rule had long been abandoned, and all the apparatuses worked nine hours at a stretch. That is, for one and a half X-ray shifts. But even with this overloading, and with the well-trained assistants rushing the patients through, the, through under the apparatus, there was still no way of fitting in as many sessions as they wanted. They had to find time for the outpatients once a day and for certain inpatients twice a day, like Astoglatov from now on, to intensify the attack on their tumors and to speed up the turnover of hospital beds. To do this, they had gone on to a 20 milliamp instead of a 10 milliamp current concealing the fact from the technical supervisor. This moved things along twice as fast, although the X-ray tubes obviously wore out quicker too. But even so, they couldn't fit everyone in. So today, Ludmila Afonsievna had come to mark the lists for which patients and for how many sessions the millimeter skin-protecting copper filter could be totally dispensed with which would shorten the sessions by half, and for which half-millimeter filter could be substituted. After that, she went up to the second floor to see how Rasonov was doing after his injection. Then she went to the short-focus apparatus room 
where patients were being irradiated again. She was trying to get down to her letters and articles when there was a polite knock on the door and Elizaveta Anatolievna asked permission to speak to her. Elizaveta Anatolievna was just an orderly in the radiotherapy department, but there wasn't a single person there who dared address her familiarly to call her Liza or Aunt Liza, as even young doctors are used to addressing quite elderly orderlies. She was a well-educated woman who spent the hours of her night duty reading French books. For some reason, she was working as an orderly in a cancer clinic and did her work very well indeed. It was true the job was paid on a time-and-a-half basis, and for a while, the clinic had paid a 50% supplement of radiation danger money. Now the supplement had been reduced to 15%, but Elizaveta Anatolievna still stuck to the job. Ludmila Afansievna, she said, slightly bowing her head in apology, as excessively polite people sometimes do. I'm sorry to trouble you with such a small thing, but it really is enough to drive one to despair. There are no cleaning rags, absolutely none. What am I to clean with? So here was something else to worry about. The ministry had the cancer clinic supplied with ra radium needles, a gamma gun, stabilivolt machines, and the newest blood transfusion equipment, and the latest synthetic drugs, but there was no place for ordinary rags and brooms on so elevated a list. Nizamutin Baramovich used to say, if the ministry failed to allow for it, what am I to do? Buy it out of my own pocket? At one time, they used to take worn out linen and tear it up for dust rags, but the domestic equipment department caught on and forbade it, suspecting that the new linen was being plundered. Now they require all worn out linen to be carried up and delivered to an office where an authorized commission could check it out before tearing it up. I have a plan said Elizaveta Anatolievna. Perhaps all of us who work in the radiotherapy department ought to bring one rag each from home. That way, we'll solve the problem, won't we? Well, I don't know, sighed Donsova, but I suppose there's no other way. All right, I agree. Will you please suggest it to Olympiada Vladislavovna? Yes. And what about Olympiada Vladislavovna? How could she get her out of the seminar? It was insane to take their best and most experienced nurse off work for ten days. She went to telephone about her, and once again she got nowhere. Then she went straight off to have a look at the patient from Tashal's. First of all, she sat in the darkness to accustom her eyes. She then looked at the barium meal in the patient's small intestine, first with him standing, then lowering the protective screen like a table, she turned him first on one side and then on the other for photographing. Finally, she ran her rubber-gloved hands over his stomach, coordinating his cries of, it hurts, with the blurred tones of dim spots and shadows on the film which, to her, were like a code. Ludmila Afansievna bound all this together into a diagnosis. Somewhere in the midst of all this, her lunch break had been forgotten. She never took any notice of it or went out into the garden with a sandwich, even in summer. At that moment, somebody came to call her to a consultation in the dressing room. First of all, the senior surgeon briefed her on the case history. Then they called in the patient and examined her. Donsova came to the conclusion there was only one way of saving her, removal of the womb. The patient, who was not more than 40 years old, burst into tears. They let her cry for a few minutes. 
but this will be the end for me. My husband is sure to leave me. Well, don't tell your husband what the operation is, Ludmila Afonseyevna drummed it into her. How will he discover? He'll never know. You can easily hide the whole thing. She was there to save life. No more and no less. In their clinic, it was nearly always life that was at stake. Nothing less than that. Ludmila Afonsievna was unshakably convinced any damage to the body was justified if it saved life. Today, however much she bustled about the clinic, there was something gnawing at her self-confidence and at her sense of responsibility and authority. Was it the pain she could clearly feel in her stomach? Some days, she didn't feel it at all. Other days, it was weaker. But today, it was stronger. If she wasn't an oncologist, she'd have dismissed it, or else had it investigated without fear. But she knew the road too well to take the first step along it. To tell her relatives, to tell her colleagues, when it came to dealing with herself, she kept herself going with a typical Russian temporizing. Maybe it'll go away. Maybe it's only my nerves. But it wasn't just that. It was something else that had been gnawing at her all day, like a splinter in the hand, faintly but persistently. Now that she was back in her own little den, sitting at her own table and reaching out for the file on radiation sickness, which the observant Kostoglatov had noticed, she realized that all day she had been more than upset, really wounded by that argument with him about the right to treat. She could still hear his words. Twenty years ago you gave radiation treatment to some old Kostoglatov who begged you not to do it. You didn't know about radiation sickness then. And in fact, she was due shortly to give a lecture to the Society of X-ray Specialists on the late after effects of radiotherapy. It was almost exactly what Kostoglatov had reproached her with. It was only recently, a year or two ago, that she and another X-ray Specialist here and in Moscow and in Baku had begun to observe certain cases that could not immediately be understood. A suspicion arose. Then it became a guess. They began to write letters to each other and to speak about it, not in lectures at this stage, but in the intervals between lectures. Then somebody read a paper in an American journal and somebody else read another. The Americans had something similar brewing. The cases multiplied. More and more patients came in with complaints until suddenly it was all given a name the late after-effects of radiotherapy. The time had come to speak of them, from the rostrum, and to reach a decision. The gist of it was that X-ray cures, which had been safely, successfully, even brilliantly accomplished 10 or 15 years ago through heavy doses of radiation, were now resulting in unexpected damage or mutilation of the irradiated parts. It was not so bad, or at any rate, it was justifiable. In the case of former patients who had been suffering from malignant tumors, even today, there would have been no other solution. They had saved the patient from certain death in the only way possible. They had given large doses because small doses would not help. And if the patient reappeared today with some sort of mutilation, he had to understand that this was the price he must pay for the extra years he had already lived, as well as for the years that still remained ahead of him. But then, 10, 15, or 18 years ago, when the term radiation sickness did not exist, X-ray radiation had seemed such a straightforward, reliable, and foolproof method, such a magnificent achievement of modern medical technique, that it was considered retrograde almost a sabotage of public health, to refuse to use it and to look for other parallel or roundabout methods. They were afraid only of acute, immediate damage to tissue and bone, but even in those days they rapidly learned to avoid that. So they irradiated. 
they irradiated with wild enthusiasm. Even benign tumors, even small children. And now these children had grown up. Young men and young women, sometimes even married, were coming with irreversible mutilations of those parts of the body which had been so zealously irradiated. Last autumn, a 15-year-old boy had come in to the surgical, not the cancer wing, but Ludmila Afonsievna had heard about the case and had managed to have a look at him. The arm and leg on one side of his body had not kept pace in growth with the other, and the same applied to the bones of his skull, so that from the top to bottom he looked bow-shaped, distorted like a caricature. Ludmila Afonsievna had checked his case records and identified him as a two-and-a-half-year-old boy who had been brought into the clinic by his mother with multiple lesions of the bones and disturbed metabolism. No one knew the origin of the lesions, but they were certainly not of the tumor type. The surgeons had sent him to Donsova on the off chance that x-rays might help. Donsova had taken charge of the case, and x-rays had indeed helped, so much so that the mother wept with joy and promised she would never forget the woman who had saved him. And now he had come in alone, his mother was no longer alive, and no one had been able to do a thing for him. Nobody could take that early dose of irradiation out of his bones. Quite recently, no later than the end of January, a young mother had come in complaining that her breast gave no milk. She hadn't come straight to Donsova, but had been sent from one department to another until finally she reached oncology. Donsova did not remember her, but in the clinic, the card index of cases was kept permanently. So someone went to the records annex, rummaged around and found her card, dated 1941. It emerged that she had come in as a child and had lain trustingly under the x-ray tube for treatment on a benign tumor no one would dream of using x-rays on today. All Donsova could do was make an addition to the old card. She wrote that the soft tissue had become atrophied and that as far as she could see, it was a late after effect of radiotherapy. Of course, no one told the deformed youth of the cheated mother that they had been incorrectly treated as a child. Such an explanation would have been useless from the personal point of view, while from the general standpoint, it might have done great harm to health propaganda among the population. But these incidents had greatly shocked Ludmila Afonsievna. They had left her with a gnawing feeling of deep-rooted and unpardonable guilt. And it was right there that Kostoglatov had struck home today. She crossed her arms, hugging her shoulders, and walked around the room from door to window and back again, across the free strip of floor between the two apparatuses that were now switched off. Was it possible? Could the question arise of a doctor's right to treat? Once you begun to think like that, no doubt every method scientifically accepted today simply because it might be discredited or abandoned in the future, then goodness knows where you'd end up. After all, there were cases on record of death from aspirin. A man might take the first aspirin of his life and die of it. By that reasoning, it became impossible to treat anyone. By that reasoning, all the daily advantages of medicine would have to be sacrificed. It was a universal law. Everyone who acts breeds both good and evil. With some, it's more good. With others, more evil. Reassure herself as she might, she knew that these accidents, combined with cases of mistaken diagnosis and of measures taken too late or erroneously, comprised no more than perhaps 2% of her activity. While those she had healed the young and the old, the men and the women, were now talking through plowed fields over the grass, along the asphalt, flying through the air, climbing telegraph poles, picking cotton, 
cleaning streets, standing behind counters, sitting in offices or tea houses, serving in the army and the navy. There were thousands of them, not all of whom had forgotten her or would forget her, and yet she knew that she would sooner forget them all. Her best cases, hardest won victories, but until the day she died, she would always remember the handful of poor devils who'd fallen under the wheels. It was a peculiarity of her memory. No, she couldn't do any more preparation today for the lecture. The day was nearly over anyway. Perhaps she could take the file home. No, she'd taken it home and brought it back to work hundreds of times. She knew it wouldn't do any good. This was what she had to find time to do, though. She had to finish medical radiology and return it to the library then read a few short articles, then write an answer, that inquiry, from the Feldscher in Tata Kopir. The light through the gloomy windows was getting bad, so she lit her table lamp and sat down. One of her interns, who had already changed out of her white coat, looked in. Aren't you coming, Ludmila Afonsievna? Then Vera Gangart dropped in. Aren't you coming? How's Rosonov? He's asleep. He didn't vomit, but he's running a temperature. Vera Kornelievna took off her closed, buttoned white coat. She was left in a gray, green taffeta dress. Too good for working in. Don't you think it's a pity to wear it every day? Don't Sova nodded at the dress. Why should I keep it? What have I got to keep it for? Gongart tried to smile but the result was pitiful. All right, Veroshka, in that case, we'll give him a full dose next time, 10 milligrams. Ludmila Afonsievna pushed the point home in her usual quick-fire manner. She felt that words did nothing but take up time. She continued writing her letter to the Feldscher as she spoke. What about Kostoglatov? Gengart asked quickly. She was already at the door. There was a battle, but he was defeated and he surrendered. Ludmila Afonsievna chuckled. And then once again, from the sharp intake of breath, when she laughed, she felt a cutting pain near her stomach. She even felt the urge to complain about it to Vera there and then, making her the first to know. She narrowed her eyes and raised them to Vera's. But then in the twilight depths of the room, she saw her in a stylish dress and high heels, as if she were going to the theater. And she decided some other time. Everyone had gone, but she stayed on. It really wasn't good for her to spend even an extra half hour in these rooms that were daily filled with radiation. But that was the way it always worked out. By the time her annual leave came round, her complexion was a pallid gray. Her white corpuscles diminished monotonously throughout the year, going as low as 2,000. It would be criminal to reduce a patient to such a count. Three stomachs was the normal daily quota for an X-ray specialist to examine. But she did 10, and during the war it had been 25, before her annual leave, she always had to have blood transfusions, and after her leave, what had been lost in the past year was never fully restored. The compelling momentum of her work was very difficult to escape. As each day drew to its end, she would note with annoyance that once again, she hadn't had time to do everything. In the middle of today's business, she had recalled the cruel case of Sibgatov. She had made a note to ask Dr. Oreshenkov's advice about it when she met him at the society. Just as she had led her interns through their work, so before the war, Dr. Oreshenkov had once led her by the hand, carefully directing her and forming her into a professional all-arounder like himself. Ludoka, he would warn her, Never over-specialize. Let everyone else specialize in their hearts, 
content, but you stick to what's yours. On the one hand, X-ray diagnosis. On the other hand, X-ray therapy. Be that sort of doctor, even if you have to be the last one in the world. He was still alive, living here in town. So she put out the lamp, but turned back from the door to make a note of some things that needed doing next day. She put on her blue overcoat, no longer new, but on the way out, turned aside to call at the senior doctor's office. It was locked. At last, she walked down the steps between the poplars and among the pathways of the medical center. Her thoughts, though, remained with her work. She did not even try or want to try to rid herself of them. The weather was nondescript. She didn't notice what it was like. It was just before twilight. On the pathways, she passed many people she didn't know. But even here, she didn't feel the natural feminine interest in how others were dressed, what they wore on their heads or their feet. She walked on, her brows knit, glancing penetratingly at all these people as if guessing the location of tumors, which gave no sign of life today, but might appear tomorrow. So she walked on past the medical center's cafeteria, past a little Uzbek boy persistently hawking newspaper cones of almonds until she reached the main gate. The unsleeping, bad-tempered, fat old female gatekeeper allowed only the free and healthy through, turning back the patients with loud yells. Once Ludmila Afonsievna went through the gate, she ought to have made the transition from the working part of her life to the domestic, to her family. But no, her time and energy were not equally divided between work and home. Inside the medical center, she spent the better and fresher half of her waking hours. Ideas about her work were still circling around her head like bees long after she'd left the gates, and in the morning, long before she reached them. She posted the letter to the Tata Kupir and crossed the road to the streetcar circle. A trolley with the right number swung round with a slight clank. There was a rush through both front and back doors. Ludmila Afonsievna hurried to grab a seat, and this was the first tiny thought apart from the hospital that began to transform her from an oracle of human destinies into a simple passenger on a trolley, jostled like everyone else. Still, as the trolley clattered down the old one-way track, or waited long minutes in sightings for another to pass, Ludmila Afonsievna was looking blankly out of the window, turning over in her mind Mirsalimov's pulmonary secondaries or the possible effect of the injection on Rusonov, his offensively didactic manner and the threats he had uttered on her rounds that morning had been overlaid during the day with other impressions. But now, at the end of the day, the oppressive sediment had been uncovered for her to contemplate all evening and all night. Many of the women in the trolley, like Ludmila Afonsievna, were carrying not handbags, but big bags, like small suitcases that could hold a live piglet or four loaves of bread. At every stop and with every shop that flashed by the window, Ludmila Afonsievna's thoughts turned more and more to her housework and her home. Home was her responsibility and hers alone, because what can you expect from men? Her husband and son, whenever she went to Moscow for a conference, would leave the dishes unwashed for a whole week. It wasn't that they wanted to keep them for her to do. They just saw no sense in this repetitive, endlessly self-renewing work. Ludmila Afonsievna also had a daughter, already married and with a little one on her hands, but now on the point of being unmarried because divorce was in the air. This was the first time today she had remembered her daughter, and the thought did not cheer her. Today was Friday. 
on Sunday, she absolutely must get through a lot of washing that had piled up. This meant that dinner for the first half of the week had to be got ready and cooked, come what may on Saturday evening. She prepared it twice a week. As for putting the washing to soak, that had to be done today, whatever time it meant getting to bed. Even though it was getting late, now was the only time left to go to the main market. The stalls there were not packed up until later in the evening. She got out to change trolleys, but looking through the plate glass window of a nearby grocery store, decided to go in. The meat department was empty, and the assistant had already gone. In the fish department, there was nothing worth taking. Herring, salt place, P-L-A-I-C-E, salt place, tinned fish. She walked past the picturesque pyramids of wine bottles and brown cylindrical rods of cheese that looked just like sausages on her way to the grocery department. She wanted to get two bottles of sunflower seed oil before there had only been one cotton seed oil and some barley concentrate. From the grocery counter, she cut across the quiet shop, paid at the cash desk, and went back to collect them. She was standing in line behind two men when suddenly there was a hubbub in the shop. People were pouring in from the streets, forming lines at the delicatessen counter and at the cashier. Ludmila Afonsievna started and without waiting to collect her goods in the grocery department, hurried across to line up at the delicatessen counter and at the cashier. So far there was nothing to be seen behind the curved glass cover of the counter, but the jostling women were absolutely confident. Minced ham sausage was going to be sold one kilo for each buyer. What a stroke of luck! It was worth going to the back of the line a bit later for a second kilo. That concludes chapter seven. And there's 10 seconds remaining on Instagram before it kicks everybody off. So head over to Periscope if you want to not be kicked off next time a chapter goes over an hour. Thanks for tuning in. Links in my bio.